um, working on test cases that uh, advocate for the rights of, equal rights, should I say, of lesbians and gay men. So she is a very important person um, to this fight. Well, you are. And um, she was famously one of the team that managed to get some rights for Maya Forstatter. And in doing so, maybe rights for all the rest of us too, to freedom of belief, etc. So I won't ramble on, I'll let her do her own thing here now, and I please welcome Anya Pamela. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about the law for a bit, so bear with me, um, and I hope I won't go too far over anyone's head, but I want to talk a bit about equality law, discrimination law in the UK, how it works. We've had laws passed, is that okay? Starting in 1970 with the Equal Pay Act. No? Starting in 1970 with the Equal Pay Act, the Sex Discrimination Act in 1975, Race Relations Act in 1976, Disability Discrimination Act in 1995, and then we started getting regulations. In 1999, we got the Sex Discrimination Gender Reassignment Regulations, which made it unlawful to discriminate on grounds of gender reassignment. And those regulations were passed because of a case in the European Court of Justice in 1996 called P against S in Cornwall County Council. So P was a male to female transsexual who lost their job for undergoing gender reassignment. And they went, with quite a creative legal argument, went to the European Court and said, this is a form of sex discrimination. And to everyone's amazement, the ECJ said, yes, this is a form of sex discrimination. And as such, it is already unlawful under European law since 1976, um, when the, it, you, European community legislated against sex discrimination in the workplace. And so then finally, um, we have three sets of regulations that were passed in 2003, making it unlawful to discriminate on three further grounds, sexual orientation, age, and religion or belief. And then all of those were consolidated into 2010 into the Equality Act, so we now have all those laws in one place and it makes more sense that way. But they all come from the, those different sources. But the source of the laws against religion and belief discrimination is the European Union. So I want to say, next I want to say a bit more about religion or belief discrimination. So in the UK, it's been unlawful since 2003. Religious beliefs are protected as of right. Philosophical beliefs are protected, but with a qualification. They have to meet certain criteria. For example, they have to be cogent, and they have to be worthy of respect in a democratic society. And what that means is that if you have a belief in the elimination of Jewish people, that's not a protected belief because that seeks to destroy the rights of others. If you believe in fascism, that's not a protected belief. But apart from that, any kind of belief. You can argue, I've got a protective belief, it's a philosophical belief, and, and my employer shouldn't discriminate against me for it. So since 2003, um, protected beliefs have been held to include a belief that climate change is real, and we're all under a moral duty to do what we can to stop it, a belief in the sanctity of life, extending to a fervent belief that fox hunting is wrong, Belief in an independent Scotland. <coughs> belief in the values of the Labour Party and democratic socialism. Belief in the efficient use of public money. Belief in not lying under any circumstances. All be held to be protective belief. Your belief being protected doesn't mean you will necessarily win your claim. But you can't win unless your belief is a protective belief. You have to distinguish between holding the belief and manifesting the belief. Holding the belief has absolute protection. Manifesting a belief has qualified protection. So to give you an example, the person who believed in not lying in it under any circumstances, they won their, their argument that their belief was protected. They lost their claim that they were discriminated against. Um, 
if you think about it, if you have a secretary and you sometimes need your secretary to tell white lies to people on the phone and say, I'm afraid he's not here today, when the truth is he doesn't want to speak to you. If you have a secretary who says, I cannot tell a lie, it's on a, whatever my religion is, it's, uh, I can't tell a lie, that person is not going to last very long as your secretary. So you're, if, if, that, if that person is, if you dismiss that person because you just don't like their belief, that would be discrimination. But if you dismiss them because you really need someone as part of their job to tell white lies from time to time, then that, that you're very unlikely to win your claim. That person isn't very unlikely to win their claim in an employment tribunal. So from about 2018, I was watching this sex and gender debate unfold on Twitter. And I started thinking, as an employment lawyer, well, people with gender critical beliefs are facing a kind of belief discrimination. So I started looking for a test case. And pretty much at the exact same time, Maya Forstutter had been watching this issue unfold, and she'd been watching on the sidelines for about a year, reading up on it and thinking about it. And then in September 2018, she started talking about it on Twitter in quite a concerted way. And if any of you follow her on Twitter, you'll know what I mean. Um, I didn't know Maya then. I didn't come across her until about six months later. Maya worked for a think tank that specializes in international development, the Center for Global Development, CGD for short. It's an American think tank, and she was a visiting fellow in the London office. She was talking on Twitter, for example, she was talking about a man called Philip Bunce, who works for Credit Suisse as a bank, as an executive. And he sometimes dresses as a woman to work and wears a wig and heels and calls himself Pippa on those days. And Philip slash Pippa was nominated for an FT award in women, for women in business. And he accepted that and gave interviews to the press and posed for photos, both in his men's suit and his women's clothes. And um, he doesn't claim and he says he's gender fluid. Maya started asking people who followed her. She took, I mean, she, I think she thought, well, he's, he's put himself in the public domain. He's accepted the award. He's given interviews. She said, look, supposing you have a panel that is all male and you're committed to not having all male pe panels and one of the people on your panel is Philip or Pippa, do you still need to find a woman or does Pip count as a woman so you don't need to? And an amazing number of people thought that this man who wears women's clothing counts as a woman, even though he doesn't even claim to be a woman, although he did accept that award. Some of Maya's colleagues took exception to her talking openly about sex and gender in this way, acknowledging that Philip Bunce is a man. And CGD then started backtracking. She, at the time, she was engaged as a consultant, but they had been planning to employ her. They told her, they would employ her if they got a grant from the Gates Foundation. And they got the grant from the Gates Foundation that she helped them apply for. And the day that they got told that they got the Gates grant, her boss pulled her aside and said, Washington have changed their mind about employing you. They don't want to employ you anymore because of your tweets. So um, it, it took a while, but, but eventually she and CGD parted company in March 2019. Maya tweeted about this. She said, I've, I've lost my job at a think tank for talking about these issues. And when she went public about it, I heard about it immediately. I got in touch with her on Twitter. I talked to her. And I knew straight away that she was the test case that I'd been looking for. So we put in a claim to an employment tribunal, and we framed the belief as follows. That Maya believes that sex is real, and it matters. That sex is not supplanted by gender identity and the women need to be able to talk about this for the protection of their rights. The legal system in the UK, most employment-related claims, you bring a claim to the Employment Tribunal, a bit like the Workplace Relations Commission here. And then if you lose in the Employment Tribunal, you can appeal to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, and beyond that to the Court of Appeal, and very occasionally the Supreme Court. Um, and there were two issues in Maya's claim. The first was, is this belief of Maya's a protected belief? And secondly, if it is a protected belief, did CGD discriminate against her because of it? So the first stage was a preliminary hearing on the question of whether her belief is a protected belief. This was in November 2019. CGD were arguing, no, 
it's not a protected belief because it's a hateful belief, it's akin to fascism. And in December 2019, the Employment Tribunal held that it was not a protected belief because Maya will not accept that trans women are women and that view is not worthy of respect in a democratic society. So that was a bad day. And you may remember the next day, J.K. Rowling was so outraged by this that she tweeted about it. Dress however you please. Call yourself whatever you like. Sleep with any consenting adults who'll have you. Live your best life in peace and security. But force women out of their jobs for stating that sex is real? I stand with Maya. This is not a drill. So we brought in a Q Q Queen's Council, then he's now King's Council, my colleague Ben Cooper, you would call him SC here, I think it might be States Council or Senior Council. <laughs> <laughs> he has a following. And we appealed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, or EAT for short, and I want to pay tribute to Ben's work on this. Ben wrote a fantastic skeleton argument basing our case on the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, because this case involves rights under Article 9, of the European Convention, freedom of thought, belief in a religion, and Article 10, freedom of expression. And that's where you look for belief discrimination cases. The appeal was heard in April 2021. We got judgment in June 2021, and we won, and we won comprehensively. The EAT didn't just say to the tribunal, you got this bit wrong, you got that bit wrong, you need to go back and remake this decision and bear those things you got wrong in mind. They said, you got this completely wrong, and if you had approached it correctly, there's only one right answer. Maya's beliefs are worthy of respect in a democratic society, and so they are protected beliefs, and she has a right to bring her claim in the employment tribunal. So they substituted what they said is the right decision, that Maya's belief that sex is real and it matters is a protected belief. And because that's a decision of the Employment Appeal Tribunal, which is an appellate court, that sets a precedent for other cases. So that means that everyone in the UK who holds a similar belief can now say to their employer, my belief that sex is real and it matters is a protected belief. And if they're being harassed for that belief, they can complain about it. And so other people like Alison Bailey have been able to bring similar claims and there's a lot more in the pipeline. The third stage was early this year in March. We went back to the Employment Tribunal for the tribunal to decide on the particular facts of this case where the CGD discriminated against Maya, and we won on that too. So what does this mean for Ireland? Going back to the religion or belief regulations that were passed in the UK in 2003, the reason we got that law in the UK when we did is because the EU said that we had to. In November 2000, the EU passed a directive called the Framework Directive on Equal Treatment and Employment. And a directive is an instruction from the European Commission to every member state to say that you have to bring in a law about this, and this is what that law has to say. And you get three years to do it. So from November 2000, it had to be done by late 2003. And um, so, in, that's why uh, so the, the, the 2000 directive says that you need to bring in laws against four kinds of discrimination, age discrimination, disability discrimination, religion or belief discrimination, and sexual orientation discrimination. And it has to cover certain types of discrimination, direct discrimination, indirect discrimination, harassment and victimization. So every member state had to bring in its own version of those laws. So in principle, because this had to be done by 2003, right? Every one of 450 million people living in the EU, that's post-Brexit, it now enjoys the protection of these laws. A couple of months ago, I decided to check whether they had in fact done this. There's now 27 member states post-Brexit, and I found that most of them just took the words religion or belief and put that in their laws. A few of them, like the UK, qualified it a bit. They said it's philosophical beliefs. Germany and Austria, they use the word Weltanschauung, which means worldview, but it translates roughly to philosophical beliefs. And a few of them qualified beliefs to 
political yeah. beliefs, and I suppose you might have an argument in court about whether the belief that sex is real and it matters is a political belief. Just one member state has restricted the protection only to people with religious beliefs. Can anyone guess which state that is? <laughs> it's Ireland. Ireland's laws against discrimination are contained in the Employment Equality Act 1988, and that was amended to implement the Framework Directive. If you look at Section 6, it lists the kinds of discrimination that are prohibited. Age discrimination, disability discrimination, sexual orientation discrimination, when it comes to religion or belief, they wrote religious belief, which means that religious beliefs are protected, but not non-religious beliefs. Now, um, I will say, I will qualify what I'm going to say here by saying I am not an Irish qualified lawyer, but it seems very clear to me on the face of it, the Irish government failed to properly implement the framework directive in respect of belief discrimination. Non-religious beliefs are not protected here, and they should be. And I believe it must be possible to challenge that failure in the Irish courts. I don't know exactly how you would do it. I've been trying to find out. Maybe it would be a judicial review. Maybe it would be some other mechanism in the High Court. But you must be able to challenge a wrongful implementation of EU law. So I've been talking to Leisha de Bruyne from the Countess. She's in the process of qualifying as a barrister, and she also, she also campaigns through the Countess. And the Countess wants to bring a test case to challenge this. So to that end, they will be looking for a woman or, or women who feel they are affected by this in their jobs. It may be you are someone who has, feels that you have to tweet about this from an anonymous account because you know you will lose your job if you tweet in your own name. And if you're in that position, you could be anonymised, you could bring a claim as X in the same way that people have done with abortion claims for cases, for example. So if you would be interested in doing that, the counters have a stall at the back. And I repeat, I'm not an Irish qualified lawyer, but I think this is a slam dunk case. The directive says religion or belief must be protected. I don't see how the Irish government can justify leaving belief out. And I don't see how a court could fail to hold that they need to change that. Um, and when you've done that, I guarantee you will start getting four statutory cases here. And that will be a very important development. Two other things I want to make clear. Um, I want to stress again, having that protection doesn't necessarily mean you will win your case. These cases are very fact sensitive. There was another case in the UK after forced out called Macarath. And that case involves a doctor who was employed by the Department for Work and Pensions. And the role he was employed in was to assess people with mental health problems. And he has strongly held Christian beliefs. And he made it clear as part of his induction process that he would not pretend that a male person is female or vice versa. So he was going to say to these people with mental health problems in front of him, he'd say, well, you're not, you may think you're a woman, but you're not. They couldn't have that. They felt that would be bad for the people concerned. So he lost his job. He lost his tribunal claim, and he lost on appeal. Maya's case is in a different category of case because she wasn't working with any transgender people. She actually said that if she were to work with them, she would respect people's preferred pronouns. The issue in her case was that her employer just didn't like her beliefs. So that was clearly discrimination. The other thing I want to say, and again, it's quite an important message, those of you who work in the public sector, if you are discriminated against at work for your beliefs, you may be able to bring a case without waiting for the government to amend the Employment Equality Act. And that's because there's a principle in EU law that directives can have direct effect against what we call emanations of the state. So if you work in the civil service, maybe a local government, maybe you're a teacher in a state school, you might be able to go straight to the Workplace Relations Commission and say, I lost my job, it was belief discrimination, and I'm relying on the framework directive directly. If that's you, don't take my word for it, do get legal advice, but I see no reason why you would not be able to rely on the directive directly. If you need help finding a lawyer, again, speak to Leisha de Bruyne at the Countess because she's been doing the work of finding solicitors who are qualified and willing to take instructions on this issue. And the final thing I would say to you, if you live in any of the other EU member states, if you have friends there, spread the word that everyone in the EU 
has a right to equal treatment in employment regardless of their, their beliefs. Let's have four statute cases all over the EU. Yeah.